All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Climbing Majority Podcast. Uh, we are sitting down here with Eddie Taylor. Eddie, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we're just going get, to get, uh, get going here. Eddie, you are a, I would say, a very accomplished and I would assume a very busy person. Um, you know, just as a, you know, a, a summarization of kind of some of the things you've done in the past, you, you know, you started in track and field, you were a decathlete, you got into climbing, you have a chemistry degree, you are now a chemistry teacher, you teach track and field, and in your climbing realm, you are also super successful. You have Moonlight Buttress under your belt, Nose in a Day, Everest, the list goes on. My, my question here is, you know, how is this possible? Um, how do you get all of this done? You know, life gets super busy. Um, you technically have two full-time jobs. You're a husband, you're a recent parent, um, and now, you know, entering the realm of a professional rock climber, I think there's plenty of people in the world that would consider just parenting and a full-time job alone almost too much to handle um, and feel like they might not have enough time for their hobbies. So how do you feel like you manage your time and how do you make this life that you're living possible? Oh, man, that's like a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't even know. I just I just try my best at every time. You know what I mean? Like, like if I'm at work, I'm focusing on work. If I'm coaching, I'm focusing on coaching. And I just, you know, I really try hard when I'm not doing either of those two things. And I'm not at home hanging out with my wife and kid as we're trying to figure out some time to climb. And it's it's hard. Like, <laughs> I can't really say it's a it's an easy thing. I've been trying to get a little bit more disciplined in the time I'm out actually climbing and you know you know like you guys know you go to the gym and you like talk and you hang out and you do those things and now I've kind of had to really tighten things up to try to try to maintain in all those different areas and and so what's like uh this kind of lifestyle takes a, a you know like you said you have to trim things up there's sacrifice like and that requires dedication and motivation so like what inspires you to try so hard and and to try to achieve all of these things that you've done i mean i love climbing like ever since i started rock climbing i love climbing i've always tried to make it something that i i i don't know something that i get out and do um and so like i've kind of i've definitely like structured my life around how can i go out and how can i climb more and how can we make this happen um, but also without giving up, like, like, yeah, it's kind of always a climber's dream to like quit your job and go on the road and live in the van and, you know, spend months and months on in at the Creek or wherever you're at. But I mean, I've just, the way I've grown up, I've always, you know, I've wanted to make sure that I could have a job and, you know, find that stability and also give back to the community. And, and that's kind of what I do with my teaching career. And so for me, like, Climbing is awesome. I love it. It's amazing. But at the same time, I don't think it would be as satisfying if I wasn't, if I didn't have that other half where I'm giving back to the community and I'm, you know, working with kids and helping try to shape their future. So it's a hard balance, but things really fit together. If you kind of like really think about it, like with the teaching, right, you have summers off and those are not the best time to climb in the U S but you can still go to some really cool areas. Um, and then with the teaching, like throughout the year, it makes you have to be disciplined in training and have to be like disciplined in your time. And so I kind of feel like, like it's almost like I have like a climbing season and almost like an off a training off season, which works really well. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. I think that's something we advocate here on the podcast a lot is is finding balance in our lives. Um, I think that's one thing that I learned personally after my injury um, is that you know there was more in my life that I needed to find out, and there was more meaning to be had outside of climbing. And so. It's interesting that, you know, you, you found that early on and there's this calling that you have outside of climbing. But I think the interesting thing here is that, you know, you're achieving these amazing things in climbing while still having that mentality. And I think a lot of people think that in order to achieve some of the things that you've done, whether that be nose in a day or moonlight buttress, where you need to dedicate a large portion of your time towards climbing, um, and they might not be achievable without it. And I definitely, you know, feel like that a little bit. Like if I wanted to do some of the things you've done, I'd have to change my life tremendously and dedicate more time to climbing. So um, what do you attribute your your success in that realm with having, you know, dual focuses in your life? I don't I don't know. I mean, I guess I always feel like I need to do more to become a, 
a better climber and to do the next best thing. Like I, I think that's kind of just a natural feeling that everybody has. Um, and I, I think for me, it's just, I, like in whatever form I love getting out climbing, right? Like if I'm going to put a, you know, most of these trips, like even Moonlight Budgers, it started as, all right, I want to go on a big climbing trip. Boom. Okay. I got to take these days off. I got to plan it. I start putting all the planning into it. And then, um, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do the best I can. And so I can't really say that it's necessarily like I am really focused on training to that level or to some level. It's just, I'm, you know, that's my break. That's the time I have, but I'm going to go out and, and like I said, do the best I can. Would you consider yourself a naturally gifted climber? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, you have a very laissez-faire, uh, attitude towards the, I think, or a laissez-faire or humble, um, attitude towards these achievements and kind of, uh, your, your performance in, in, uh, climbing. I find that interesting. Um, you know, cause I, I mean, I, I look at you and I'm, you know, inspired and like, wow, like how do you, you know, you, you get all this done and, you know, to hear just like, oh yeah, you know, I just, I make the plan and I go, you know, it, <laughs> it makes me wonder if like, there's, there's something else there, Max, like, do you, you know, have anything to add there uh, in terms of just like that attitude and, and all that? I think something that I'd like to just tease out a little bit more, and this is like just totally self-interested from my own perspective is I think it's easy to see individuals such as yourself, Eddie, who do seem to, you know, maybe, I don't know, you might have a different opinion, but like, I would say like, like you have it all, you're doing so many things and there's kind of maybe a casual, like, I don't know, like I've kind of just put this together. And sometimes for me, that doesn't fully tease out, like actually the process that you went through to get to where you are and how you're feeling and how you've managed to do that. Does that make sense? Like to slowly progressively take on more and more, at least that's the assumption I'm making. And like, so an example I could give is right now I'm a full-time student. I'm, you know, with my girlfriend, she works full-time, um, you know, and she supports me. It's this really interesting kind of relationship. And I'm, you know, stressed to the max. Like I'm, my life is, is I'm struggling right now. Like in, you know, stress to the max, ah, funny max, but, um, and, and, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I am struggling a lot right now and I want to take on more. And like, I know with like my partner, Ray, like we want to have a kid, you know, like we really do, but like, we can't see how f that would be feasible at all to take on more responsibility right now and stuff. And so like, I look at someone like you where it's like, you've caught, like I could dedicate 10 lifetimes and I don't think I'd ever be destined to like climb moonlight buttress or anything, even if I just lived in a van and did that. And so I'm wondering like, was this process something that you kind of just like slowly developed or was this really like this, like arduous, hard process? And maybe you're underselling that a little bit. Like, what was that like for you? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, Again, I mean, I guess it's everyone's experience, right? Like you're saying you can never climb Moonlight Butchers. There's plenty of climbs where I'm like, man, I'm never going to climb 514. I'm never going to climb 515. I know I'm never going to climb 515, but <laughs> but like, you know, I'm looking at those like things and I'm like, there's things I can, I'm never going to do. But I think that's changed a lot of times in my life. Um, and I would say like, like it, it's really hard to answer this question. I would say I um when I was in college, I ran track and in track, I, you know, dedicated 35 to 40 hours a week training. Plus I had a double major plus, you know, I tried to maintain some sort of social life. And so like I was doing a lot then and, you know, it was just expected of you and that's what you wanted to do. You know, I wanted to make sure that I was you know, doing the best I could in school. I felt like I had a lot of pressure in, in those regards as well as, you know, track was a very important thing to my life. And so I was trying to balance all of those then. And I feel like by doing that for four years, plus, you know, growing up, I did sports and all of the things I think a lot of people have. Um, but I feel like I got a, I kind of got practice at having to balance those things and just having to take a lot on and, you know, having to just accept it. Like it's good. It's bad. It's just the way, the way life is. And so I think, you know, moving past there, when I think I had a little bit more flexibility in my life, I was more, guess my capacity to take on more was there. Um, and I think that's kind of what's helped me progress in climbing and to be able to balance these type, like this many things. Um, but with that said, I, I know you asked, like, do you feel like you're a naturally gifted climber? Honestly, I don't, I just, I'm a, 
I just started a training program recently and I did the assessment and I'm like below one Sigma in almost every category, <laughs> <laughs> meaning like I'm like far outside of the, the range of average for like how much I can, I can hang on a hang board, how long I can hang on the hang board, how flexible I am. So, um, it's like, I'm not, I can't say I'm the most gifted, especially when you start looking at those hardcore numbers, but I think I do have a knack for learning technique and learning how to climb, like use my, what I have to the best of my ability. I think, uh, you, uh, the ability to take on more, the ability to be busy all the time. I think that a lot of people who find themselves in that, in that space experience, you know, what's called burnout. Um, I definitely, I ran cross country and track throughout high school and I, I burned out. It was too much. It was like, I took on too much. Um, and for me, I think it was because I, I lost a passion in what I was doing. Um, how have you managed to avoid burnout and continue to have a passion for everything that you're doing? Cause that's such, it's so required in order to stay as busy as you are. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would say that after college track, I competed a little bit afterwards and I, I actually, I got, for lack of a better word, burned out from track as well. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Um, but with that said, I was still like interested in how far I could push myself. And I loved the community that I had when I was running track and I didn't really have that after college. And I, and kind of when I got into climbing, climbing was like, oh man, you have success all the, like, you know, when you race, when you're doing track or jumping or any of those, like you fail all the time. Like you're never doing better than you can, but climbing every time you hop on a new route, you're like, oh man, that's a success. I hop on to try this other route. That's a success. You try a new style of climbing. That's a success. And so I feel like I really enjoyed that. And that's part of climbing that I think has really kept me inspired and invigorated. Plus like the climbing community is huge. You know, you, everywhere you go, you meet a climber, you know, you see like, they have like a carabine in their keys and you're like, Oh man, you're a climber. I'm a climber. Cool. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, you have that community, you have like all those markers and milestones for success. And then you get to travel and see cool places. Like those three things, I think for me, it helps me not get burnt out of climbing. And again, like I know I have friends who, you know, they enter the sport, they leave the sport. A lot of times they're very focused on grades or what they can achieve there. And I, I guess, honestly, I haven't at this point. So that's really interesting. Like what you're saying about maybe not necessarily being like super focused on grades and stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe dive into these two ascents we've kind of, you know, talked about here, which is the nose and moonlight. Um, you know, like what, what was this big, like catalyst for you to want to take on these kind of projects and, and maybe if we can like dive into that, that'd be really great. Yeah. Um, well, the nose that I guess I did I think I did that before Moonlight. The nose is interesting. So probably me wanting to climb the nose started back in say 20, 2018, I think. Anyways, I went and I guess in 2018 I climbed Mount Watkins with a coworker. And it's a uh it's a big climb in the valley. It's like one of the three biggest walls in Yosemite. You have Half Dome, Mount Watkins, and you have El Cap. And so I was like, I was talking to my coworker and he's like, oh, well, you've climbed Denali. You're like a pretty decent track climber. We should go climb a wall together. And I was like, sure. I didn't know anything back then in terms of what big wall climbing was and whatnot. And so we put this trip together. We planned. We didn't train at all, to be honest. He was like, oh, yeah, I climbed. I climbed El Cap like four or five times back in the day. And he's, he was a bit older than me. Um, but we didn't really train. And as we were getting closer, I was getting nervous and I asked a couple of my friends, Hey, okay. I know you've climbed the nose. I know you've big walled, like show me how to eight climb. I need to know how to eight climb or else I'm gonna, <laughs> this is not going to be a, a fun time. And so I went to this local crack where like, I tell everyone, like, this is how you learn to climb the nose. You go climb this crack. But I went to, um, country club crack and I spent probably two weeks there coming almost every day after work. And first I believe my friend. And, uh, he kind of showed me how to eight up, eight up this crack. And then, you know, I got my turn on lead and then I learned how to like top rope solo. And I started like learning how to aid climb on top rope solo. And then kind of by the end of those two weeks, I was like, all right, well, I know how this is how you lead rope solo, which you showed me as well. And so I could just like figure out all of the aiding there very slowly on my own. 
and this was probably like seven or eight sessions at that point and it was time to go to Yosemite and that was that was an adventure to say the least first of all we drove into the valley and you know you pass El Cap and then you keep driving all the way to the back of the valley before we had to start this I think it's like six miles to Watkins or something like that I don't really remember but uh we brought the biggest rack possible. I think it said you need a triple rack. My coworker was like, we should bring a quad rack. <laughs> Sounds like me on yes. a free climb. Sounds like standard 5'8 yeah. climbing to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we were like, oh, we, we want to go light. It's so only one haul bag. So we brought a backpack and one haul bag. I ended up having to carry the haul bag. <laughs> and then it's supposed to be a clean aid route, but it said, oh, it could be missing pin, like fixed pins or things. So we brought brought a hammer we brought all this metal that never left the bag the entire trip yeah. and training. i had about a i would imagine a hundred pound pack hiking out to the base of mount Watkins. so it was pretty rough and when we got there i didn't know how to aid climb so well i learned a little bit but like i didn't really i still had never done it on a big wall and so like the first day typically you climb the route and then i mean people do it in a few hours but typically it's three to four days and the first day we got two pitches up <laughs> <laughs> and at that point my coworker was like you know the, the wall is just so big i don't i don't know if i can lead anything so if we're going to the top you're gonna have to lead everything yeah oh geez and uh needless to say we did get to the top yeah wow but that was on si the sixth day we were out of water we topped out he we weren't gonna climb at night at all because i guess modern climbers climb at night and back in the day they never climbed at night so we only climbed the night when we ran out of water and we had to get to the top. <laughs> so wow. it was just, it was slow and go a couple pitches a day until the last day when we did the second half of the route, because we kind of had to. Yeah. yeah. And at that point I was like, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to quit climbing. This is, this is too much. <laughs> and we hiked all the way back down to the car. We went and like, I don't even remember where we slept, but, uh, I think we drove out of the park and we like stayed at a hotel for that night, like ate some food and I was still like, man, I'm done. But I was, there was three more days to my flight back home and we went back and we like hiked up to El Cap and I was like, man, cause this is like a 20 minute hike versus this like four hour hike with a hundred pound haul bag. <laughs> and we were just like kind of exploring the base and I was pretty worked at the same time. But when I got home, I was like, okay, wait a second. So you can climb a longer route, a cooler route. I actually, I can't say the nose is much more cooler than uh, Watkins, but longer route, cooler route, way shorter approach, and you don't have to have a hundred pound haul back. And that's kind of what really got me stoked on, on wanting to do the nose. Just good selling point there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, in general, do you just find that, okay, at least the sense that I get from you is like, kind of a little lazy fare, but also like really like go getter attitude. Do you, do you find that you stay just positive in bad situations pretty well? Yeah, I think that's, that's one thing that I, I do pretty well is kind of like, I can kind of keep focused on the goal and, and stay positive. And for me, that's, I think that's something that like, I think that's why a lot of people want to climb with me, <laughs> or at least a lot of my climbing partners say they want to climb with me. It goes a long way. <laughs> I bet I like I was going to say, Kyle, I think that's in its in itself is kind of like a superpower. Like there's so many times in life, I think that people are actually capable of doing things. Um, but if if you can't like keep your calm, keep a positive attitude and be willing to try, then you just like won't be able to do it. So like having that ability to kind of like do what you know, you you alluded to there essentially is like, I think that can just get you so far in life and do so many things, you know, like. I think there's tons of things I could climb that I'm just not willing to try or that I haven't been or that I've been hamstringing myself with these kind of arbitrary, you know, non-existent mental barriers of saying like, you know, even at the beginning of this conversation, we started off by saying like, oh, I'll, I'll never climb, you know, 512. And you're like, well, I, I thought the same thing about myself. Right. And like, you know, here you are now X amount of time later where you have like accomplished these things. So that's an interesting thing. I think that just, you know, the limit the, the the arbitrary slash false limitations we put on ourselves as individuals that are hamstringing us that you know really just aren't like aren't true right like i don't know that's yeah something interesting yeah and i think part of it's kind of like you know there's things like like i said at the end of that story like yeah i really wanted to climb the nose because of all of x y and z but honestly if i didn't have that opportunity someone didn't drag me to 
try Mount Watkins, maybe I would have never gotten that psyched on the nose or felt like I was prepared to do it. So I kind of feel like there's a, there's a balance between like goals that you set for yourself and you want to pick. And then those, those just random opportunities A friends like, Hey, do you want to go try this route? Or do you want to go blame me on this route? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you try it and you, these are, you're like, Oh, okay. Maybe I can climb this grade or maybe I can do this super sandbag route. So I mm-hmm. kind of feel like it's kind of that balance, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like if I, if I think of for myself, like what got me into climbing, like I was at this particular period of my life where I needed a lot of change. Um, my mother was like terminally ill with cancer at the time. And, uh, this, this gentleman, Terry Louie at the, the, the store I was working with, you know, he, he just like one day we were talking, having a good laugh. And he was like, Hey, do you want to go like ice climbing with me? And it was like, like yeah like fuck yeah i want to go do that that seems awesome and like went and did that and that was my first time climbing outside ever and it was like you know that day just this was the raddest thing i had ever done it wasn't really on my radar i wasn't really thinking about it too much i was getting into endurance sports at the time but like having that person you know be there to like mentor slash offer the opportunity to me like completely transformed my life. Like I just dove, like I'm not exactly the most talented climber ever, but like I dove head first. It's like climbing was just like, it was like, whatever this is, it's so rad. I like my life just needs this in it all the time. Like I'm, I'm like full spiritually as a human being when I'm doing these kind of things, if that makes sense. Right. And, and yeah, it was life, life transformative. So I think that is like a, a crazy thing to, to think about for sure. What was like the, the, or sorry, just but what was like the impetus or like the catalyst for you, like getting involved in climbing? Like, how did that happen? Who, who helped you with that? Usually there's someone I find helped you into that, right? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I kind of alluded to this a bit earlier, but like when I got, I got into climbing, I was getting burnt out of track and field. I was training by myself. I was still trying to pole vault a little bit higher, um, than I had in college and I was getting better, but it's just hard to train by yourself. And I had lived in Boulder for four, I guess five years at that point. I didn't know what climbing was other than like, you know, people going and climbing Mount Everest. Um, that's kind of like my joke. I always say, I'm like, that's literally all I knew about climbing before, before, uh, 2013. And, uh, a friend invited me to go climbing and I went out she gave me a Grigory. She gave me a harness and I, uh, tried it for the first time. I belayed her on her five, eight project and she sent it and. I went up after and that was like my first day, day out climbing. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I'm not sure everybody gets that opportunity, right? Like, you know, people like, you know, for myself too, like Bryce, my buddy Bryce just invited me to climb the nose and it's like, you know, why did he choose me? Like, you know, and why did someone invite the invitation to you, Eddie and, and Max, the same thing? Like, why is someone inviting this to you? Like, in a way, you know, there is a level of sacrifice, I guess. It depends on on the circumstances. But at the same time, too, it's like that person's choosing you for a reason. So like what kind of person do you want to be and what kind of person are you to kind of attract that in your life? And I think that that boils back down to like just a general stoke for for life, for people, putting yourself out in the community and, and being connected with other people, um, have, you know, having a good, you know, good connection with people, having a good attitude, like you know, what other characteristics do you feel, you know, would kind of attract more of those opportunities for people? Yeah. I I don't know. I guess like everyone picks partners for, for different reasons. I think, um, like me and a a couple of my other friends, we always talk about like our list of partners, right. And our list of partners is curated in, in certain ways, right? Like I, mine, which I got from a, a climbing partner is like ability, compatibility, and availability, right? Like if you have two <laughs> hours to climb a week, you got to find someone who has time to go climbing. A hundred percent. But at the same time, right? Like, okay, the times work out, but okay. Do they have the ability? Can they do that route that you want to do? Are they compatible? Will it be fun to do that route that, that you want to do? And so I kind of feel like, at least for me, those are like the three things that I look at. And I think that it, you know, it kind of balances out a little bit, you know, like if the ability is not there, well, maybe you have to change the the objective if the availability is not there well at this point in my life well it's just like too bad (laughs) (laughs) that's actually cool i've never heard those like the three pillars of choosing a partner i like that a lot um i think the one thing that's funny that i've run into is like 
you know, I, I've been blessed and where I haven't had a lot of issues trying to find a partner. And I kind of wondered for a while, I was like, oh, like that sucks. Like, why are people struggling to find partners? Like, and then I realized it's like, because I'm not climbing that hard. <laughs> you know, it's like when you get to a certain level and you're starting to choose these harder climbs, the pool of people that you can climb with starts to shrink rapidly. Um, and so it just becomes really hard to find someone the the ability pillar, like you were saying. Yeah, um, and you always like, you kind of get locked into like the same the same group of people. And I, I think that's, I mean, it's nice and it's also, it's hard a lot of times um, in general, right? Like I get locked into climbing with my same, same couple partners. Um, and I've, I've definitely made an effort in the last couple of years to kind of expand that. Cause one, you just learn from more, the more people you climb with, the more you learn from. And then also I think that like, I mean, it, it's just the reality of it. Like climbing is a sport that is in, you know, only, small certain groups of people climb right like in general like things have changed for the past years but you know we even talk about like race right like i until two or three years ago had climbed with my sister and pretty much no other black person and that's because you know that's that's you know i live in boulder colorado that's what i you know the folks i'm locked into climbing with all the time and i know that they're available i know that we're compatible i know they have those abilities and so i think like like there's pros and cons to having those same partners, but also it's definitely keeps the sport the way it is. So I think that's an interesting thing to tease out there. And like, you know, there's like the obvious like elephant in the room here for everybody watching the video. Like, you know, Kyle and I are two white dudes, like you're a black dude and climbing is this, you know, it, it is this like European, you know, Caucasian centric kind of dominated sport. And so I guess like, how do you view representation in the climbing community? And like, what are the implications of that? If that makes sense? Like, what is the importance of this representation? Um, I mean, I, I think it's just important in anything you do, right? Like if you can't see yourself doing it, then why are you going to have, why are you going to want to want to do it? Right? Like, I mean, most, I mean, there obviously that's changing, but most of us climbers didn't grow up with our parents climbing, right? If you're black, you're white, you're Mexican, um, whatever, like your parents didn't grow up climbing, but if you are interested in climbing, you look you're like, okay, well, maybe I, I want to try this thing called climbing, or I want to go climb El Cap, or want to go do these things. If you don't see anyone that looks like you, like when you pop into a Google search or something, like it's not going to be something that you're going to have this strong desire to do, even if it's just subconscious, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I would just say most people aren't outdoors people. So I'm not trying to say like, you know, one person's more suited to that than the other. It's just when you start looking at it, it, it that's where I think representation is really important. I think, uh, quote, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you had said that in the climbing community, there is a, approximately 1% of representation of black athletes in, in the climbing community. Is that, is that correct? Um, that's from like a, uh, American Alpine club study where they like okay. interviewed climbers. I actually don't know how scientifically accurate okay. that is or is I mean, but, nonetheless, yeah. it paints the picture of a, a small minority of yeah. representation. And you kind of had teased out a little bit of saying, you know, if, if I don't see someone that looks like me doing something, I'm not going to be inspired to do it, whether that's subconscious or not. Do you feel like that's the only reason um, why the representation is so low or do you feel like there might be, you know, there are other things that are, are in, you know, in the playing field for that. I mean, yeah, at the most basic level, I mean, I think that's, that's what's at play, but I mean, there's, there's plenty of other, other reasons, right? Like, I think it's really hard to, uh, I joked about earlier, like I would never want to in my, like from my lived experience, like I would never want to like risk the safety of a nice, you know, having my nice job and things like, well, teachings and I can't say it's a nice job, but a job that I enjoy to, <laughs> to, uh, go live on the road and, and live in my van and whatnot. And I think that just like as a community, I think the, I can only really speak to the black community, but like, I think a lot of people haven't grown up with that. Like a lot of people, you know, they're, they're one generation out from their families owning a home or one generation out from maybe a, at least me, like my parents getting a degree in college, you know? So I think it, I think societally wise, I'm not saying every individual, but I think that that becomes a lot more difficult um, to really take it and get get into climbing, if that makes yeah. makes sense. And then you know there there also is a lot of like history of like climbing in small towns and the you know all the 
the racism and things that we have in our history that that does make climbing a little bit more difficult and feel inaccessible. But I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think that representation piece is like the thing that we can like concrete fix right now, as well as, you know, I mean, I, I bring this back to teaching. Um, there's some statistics out there where like 2% of the teachers are black male teachers. And there's also statistics that you are significantly more successful if you have a teacher that comes from your demographic, if you have one teacher that comes from your demographic. So, you know, think about like, I talk, you know, it's funny because I've used this example at school, right? If you're a white student in my school, um, my school is like 30% Latino, 70% white. There's maybe one Latino teacher. If you're a white kid at my, my school, or we can be more specific, a white, a white girl at our school, you're going to have 75, 80% of the teachers are going to be like you, right? Uh, a white lady. Um, but if you are a black kid or you're a Latino kid at that school, there's a very small, very, very small percentage that in your entire high school career, you're not going to see a single person that looks like you. And so it just, again, I don't know the mechanism behind it, but it does make things harder to learn. And so you think about that community wise, right? Like there's not a lot of black people climbing, but then someone tries to get into, into climbing and they don't see anyone that's like you. And maybe you've come from a community where you've learned from people that have been more like, like you. So it's a little bit harder to, to learn if that makes sense. No, I, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting point. And like, obviously like, you know, you kind of, uh, use the phrase like lived experience. Like I don't have this lived experience at all. You know, like this is not something that I can like put myself in the shoes of and like credit to that. Like, but something I am wondering is, so for example, you are this anomaly, you could say, right. Um, and so what do you accredit or maybe, maybe just like elaborate a little bit, what do you feel kind of got you in the door into this community despite that lack of representation and stuff is there something that you can think about with that like yeah um I mean my mom's first job she she worked with the Indian Health Service and so we moved around all around the country and we lived in you know when I was really young I lived in primarily black neighborhoods but from seven eight on I was living in a lot of different communities I lived in Michigan where we were one of the few black families. I moved to Gallup, New Mexico and Kanta, Arizona. In Kanta, Arizona, there were like five families that were non Navajo in the entire the entire town. So yeah. I mean that I think that that's a very interesting interesting place to live. And then I moved up to Minnesota where again I was one of the maybe two black families in the small town we lived in. So like I've been very i guess I've been conditioned to I don't know if condition is the right word, but I've spent a lot of time in my life learning and, you know, getting to know people that are outside of, you know, my, the way I was brought up. Um, and so I spent so much time doing that, that I think like it was kind of more natural for me after, you know, graduating college to be like, oh yeah, I can, you know, I can climb, I can learn these, these things. I can be, be good at these type of things. I don't know. No, I, I think that's interesting. And like, I don't want to put words in your, in your mouth, but at least to me, like maybe what I tease out of that is like from your own experience, moving around and having these different like cultural experiences and being exposed to these different groups, there's almost kind of this like mutual, like symbiosis, right? It's like, like I benefit from that and you benefit from that, from us being exposed, like to these different kind of like, you could call it societal norms or cultures or differences, right? Where it's like, there's like, this, this growth that both people can experience. So it's like this mutual relationship where we can both just benefit from that. If that makes sense. Right. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? hundred percent agree. hundred percent agree. I mean, yeah. I always talk about these things in terms of like, I mean, the representation is a hard topic, right? Like you're not, you don't want to alienate people. You don't want to like, like I'm never like calling someone out or saying, saying anything like that. But I mean, I think it's a hard topic, but I mean, I just think as things get more norm normal, like, it helps everybody, right? Like it's not weird all of a sudden to see a, see a black person at the crag. Like that's just normal. Like it doesn't have to be for some type of special diversity event or something. Like it's like, no, I live, I live 15 minutes from Eldo. I climb there two, three days a week because I live close to there and that's just normal. And I think the more that the more people are out, the more normalized that is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, obviously I don't know from personal experience, but 
you know, like I have, yeah. at least in some ways, like a darker sense of humor. And I, I hope this doesn't come across wrong. But like, for example, there's a quote from one of the articles here where like you were on a ski lift and, you know, the person wanted to congratulate you for being the first black person on a ski lift. And like, to me, like, I just like process that as humor because it's like unfucking believable that like in 2024, there's like, you know, somebody who's going to like congratulate a black person for like being on a ski lift. So I don't mean it's like comical in the aspect of like, that's funny. Like, it's funny how ignorant and ridiculous that like just premises in itself, if that makes sense. Right. And so sometimes we can be in our own local areas and, and, and assume like, oh, like, you know, maybe that's happening everywhere. You know what I mean? When in reality, like, for example, like I live in BC, it's a pretty progressive area. We talk a lot about like just race relations and particularly here, there isn't like a large black culture, obviously, if anybody's been to BC understands, but like there's a lot of these issues are kind of analogous to the Aboriginal issues, right? And so, um, yeah, like, you know, it, it's easy to like project like, oh, everybody's having these discussions or everybody's aware of this. And then you hear of examples like this and it's like, I don't really know how that would affect me as an individual. And maybe it's easy to brush that off. And so I'm wondering, like, how much do you attribute that to really like having effect like on individuals getting into these sports? Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. And I mean, honestly, for me, like, it's just like a funny story. Like, I, I don't really feel like um, I'm like, oh, man, that guy like pointed me out. But like, I, I've just been so used to that. But I think for someone else, like, um, like someone else who hasn't had a lot of those experiences, they, you know, that might feel like, oh man, I'm, I'm, am I supposed to be here? This seems weird, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. People are just in general are so much like, so in their bubbles. Um, and it's just, it's the way it is. I mean, I don't know. How, I always think about this example. Okay. So like my wife is always like, there's no way, like how would Trump win? And then I'm like, well, you look at the Facebook and like the town I grew up, I grew up on, like every single person's voting for Trump. And then we live in Boulder and every single person's like, you know, anti-Trump. And so it's yeah. just like everyone lives in this bubble where they're like, they feel like every single other person in the world thinks exactly the same way they do, which is obviously just not, not the case. Yeah. I, I think to, to also like tease something out there, which I, at least, at least my, estimation on these incredibly inflammatory you know like politics race a lot of these things have almost become like sports teams you know like two sides yelling at each other and and the reality is like we actually want either side to get together and like have a conversation like it's in everybody's best interest back to like what you alluded to where it's like having these different cultural experiences it's like symbiosis to like get people to like get together but sometimes it's really easy to kind of just do like finger pointing at other groups if that makes sense and that like is divisive in itself just like makes you makes the person not receptive to the conversation or the argument you're going to have you know what i mean like for me it could be really easy and like i feel like going out on a limb here but it'd be really easy for me to just blow off like so what there's not that many like black people in your area like how could that really affect you you know getting into climbing but like in reality that actually really could have like a, a drastic effect and like just dismissing that argument is like a really bad idea because like i don't actually understand that from my position because i've been fortunate enough and you know people would use the terminology like privilege to to not have to experience that or deal with that and so i just think like there's like there's like a middle ground here i don't know like to to just trying to create a path where, uh, um, yeah, like you can just get somebody who's maybe not as receptive to your idea, uh, to be receptive to that idea. You know what I mean? Like, like I've, I've seen online where like people have been in comment sections of Instagram or something like Kai Leitner, uh, would be a good example of this where like, I've seen him post like things in the comment section of like, people just kind of really missing the point of like certain things he's trying to make about like representation or, or his like recent ascent. Uh, I forget the name of the, the climb. It's like a 515A climb, but like, it's just easy to like, to miss the point and be inflammatory uh, in today's age. If that makes sense. I feel like I just went way too tangentially and didn't make a good enough point, but no. like, does that make sense? No, like, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And I, and honestly, I think, you know, most, 
most climbers from honestly most climbers regardless of background i think want to just talk about climbing and not have to feel like they have to talk about representation and those type of things but i think i mean you don't want to you don't want to like I mean, you, you want to make room for the people coming after you, I think. And so that's kind of why I think a lot of, a lot of people from different backgrounds feel like they, they have to talk about those type of things and they have to talk about representation. They have to, I mean, I talk about representation a lot. Um, and sometimes I don't actually, sometimes I just talk about pure sport, you know? Yeah. (laughs) That's what I call it. But I've got, I've got two questions here. So one, I think when we were talking about bubbles, um, I, I too am in a, in a very, I would consider a pretty small bubble. Um, and, and, and mixing this with the comment that the guy made on, on the ski lift, you know, if I were at a crag and I saw a, a black climber, I, I wouldn't even really see that person as like a, a black person. I'm like very colorblind in that way. I'm not going to like make a comment be like, Oh, there's a black person here, you know? And so like, uh, to me, like those kind of comments, like the guy made on the chairlift are, are mind blowing to me that people are even saying these things. And if someone were to ask me, like, um, you know, if, if I would be surprised, I'm I, basically what I'm saying is I'm surprised that someone would say that. So I'm curious if you can try to help me understand a little bit in terms of maybe some more experience, more experiences that you've had at the crag that were maybe like that, that someone, you know, is kind of recognizing race in a way that might be perceived in a weird way from you and whether that's, you know, meant as a, you know, a a positive or as a negative from that person. I'm just curious as to, to kind of some, you know, ideas or some experiences you've had in that, in that realm. Honestly, like I can't say I've had a lot of those experiences recently. I mean, I I have, have here and there definitely more when I was, was uh, definitely more in the past than I've had now. But I think a lot of times, I mean, you hear this happen all the time I have a lot of female climbing partners and like you know they'll show up to a crag right and it's always like okay people just assume that like they'll like for instance I climb with Nina Williams a bit and like literally we were climbing the diamond uh this was like two or three years ago um maybe two years ago now we're climbing the diamond right and like I show up show up to the top of the first pitch and we're simul climbing um up on the diamond and people are like oh I'm not sure if they should pass. Maybe you can pass. Oh, no, no, you can pass. And then, like, as I was going by, they look down. They're like, oh, wait, his partner's a girl. Like, I hear them talking to each other. <laughs> I'm like, you guys know that, like, my partner climbs, like, crazy harder than you guys ever will. And you guys are being guided up this right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, yeah. I think women face a lot of that at the crag, even if they're never, people aren't like, oh, man, she's a woman here or there. But a lot of times people get, you know, the questions will be directed to the man, the correct the questions will be directed like you know assuming that like the guy can lead this route here or there and i think that that's like a really interesting thing and that that happens to me a lot you know and then i mean it'll even happen like people you know you can kind of almost see it in their faces like you know me and like one of my like my wife or one of my female partners and they're like okay so is this black guy leading it or is this woman leading it like it's kind of a- <laughs> they're like confused to like uh, 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 i don't know <laughs> yeah and wow. like and a lot of times, like, you know, it's it definitely, I think it's sometimes a generational thing, sometimes not. Cause I mean, there's plenty of, you know, longtime climbers that are, are great. And I know them. we have great rapports. And then there are people who are like, I've been climbing here for a long time. And like, you shouldn't be climbing this route this way or doing this thing. Like that's, I've had those exact, like showed up to an ice crag and someone's been like, oh, that route's not leadable. And I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me show you. Yeah. So that, that happens. And I think it's, it's just weird. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And I mean, that just makes me like, sorry to beat a dead horse here, but like go back to this like bubble, like for me in my own bubble, it's like, okay, I, I show up to like climb base five is this like local gym for me. It used to be the edge. Like I show up there. I'm an incredibly self-deprecating person. I have the build of like a rugby player, like, you know, like a large 198 pound man. And then like, I go there and there's like, eight year old like girls like you know climbing my like 30 year dream project from now you know what i mean it's like or yeah. like people of like people of color on the team or anything it doesn't it just doesn't matter so like to me climbing is just this this like great equalizer where it's it's i am 
I would never assume to like be like, oh, I'm better than you. Like, you know, the vast majority of females I've ever climbed with are like way better than me or everybody I've ever climbed with. So like I would never assume to look at another person and be like your sex or the color, like the pigment of your skin is going to dictate if you can climb, you know, hard, like most people just climb harder than me. So it just like, doesn't even matter yeah. to me if, if that makes sense. And yeah. I think obviously there is like a little bit of, uh, maybe ignorance, like in that statement for me, but like Kyle kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. And I'm wondering like what your thought process on, like, what do you think of the model of like moving towards like color blindness like you know like i'm just like not viewing race or not viewing sex at all like is that something you adhere to or is there like different models of of like thinking about like this long term that you can think about it it's really hard um and that and i kind of go back to some of my teaching training when i think about this right because everybody does come in with a unique a unique challenges and unique things that have faced them societally wise wide right we talked a little bit about that earlier um in terms of like if you're okay well, you know you think about okay why why aren't there more this person or this person out climbing well you kind of kind of think about what where they come from and so i i don't necessarily think that like the color blindness in all aspects is sorry i haven't really thought about this fully but in no, all sorry. aspects is like is um the best way to handle it but also like i mean i think it's just like humans forming biases is like a natural process right like mm -hmm. climbing's dangerous like climbing is really really dangerous like you can die by one mistake and so you know i think a lot of people in general right you you make these assumptions you make these stereotypes just based off of lived experiences right and so if you're at the crag and you see someone getting ready to like I mean, here's an example. You, you're, we, I was like three years ago. We were at this crag. We, we were, um, we were at Eldo, and I saw this group of two guys with bright, shiny new cams, um, like shoes that you would climb in the gym with, ready to sim like getting ready to simul climb this. Like, it was a five eight route that had some consequence on it, and I didn't say anything. And I, you know, I kind of felt bad because they they epicked pretty bad on it on that thing like right after the second pitch and it's like okay well i did make an assumption that they probably were going to struggle they were new like from the things i noticed right was brand new shiny cam so either they're like you know they just got them for some reason or they always use new cams or they're brand new climbers but i you know you, you could have made those assumptions and i and i did but i didn't act on them and so like was it right? Was it wrong? I don't really know. And so I think like if you're someone who's not used to seeing competent people of color out climbing, you're not used to seeing competent women out climbing. Those are wrapped into those same assumptions that I made about those folks with the brand new shiny cams and like tarantula laces. Yeah. I don't know. So I own a it's pair. really hard to like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, no diss on the tarantula laces. No, 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 that's totally fine. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think you, you, you bring up an interesting point. I think that, yeah, I mean, you, you, in that situation, you could have prevented something bad from happening, but you are also projecting your own obser observations on those people. And it's like, in the end, it's, it's, it's a hard line to dance. Like, you know, I'll ultimately, obviously the main rule here is like, be positive, like don't use your biases to, pr you know, present any sort of negative emotions or negative feelings or put people down or to just be negative or hateful in any way. Like obviously that's not acceptable and no way anybody should be living. Um, but even if someone's trying to be positive and trying to help somebody else, if it's based around this bias of race or their understanding of the person's appearance, I could see how that could be taken kind of a little bit. You're like, ah, like, come on, dude, you know, like, why are you making that assumption of me or something like that? So, uh, in your shoes of, of somebody who might be making those assumptions, like what do you feel like the best route for people are? Is it just like to kind of just keep those comments to themselves or, you know, should we be saying, you know, what we're thinking? Like it's, what, what do you feel like the dance there is? Yeah. I mean, I guess like when I reflect on that situation, I just brought up, I think, um, 
like I guess as long as long as your assumption is not necessarily based off of like their appearance or their gender or any of any one of those type of um more like class class type things mm -hmm. um and it's just based off of like pure observation of uh like a climber to climber it's like you yeah. as a climber you look like you might be underprepared for what you're about to do yeah not you know you're a female i think you might not be prepared for this yeah, yeah. but it, again it's hard to like what are those exact like this is there a checklist all right like are you gonna go and like analyze and check off the people at the crag you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah. such a weird thing and like you know and i don't think it's as bad in sport climbing or in bouldering where that's it's less consequence but as you start to get to things that are just significantly more consequence like i mean ice climbing like you don't want to fall at all right and if someone takes a big fall on a route that's like everyone's having a bad day so i i can yeah i see kind of both sides of it but at the same time like i i definitely know how know how it feels to be one of those people that 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 happens to and like i said i climb with lots of female climbers who that happens to regularly as well so it, it doesn't feel good and i i just don't really have the answer it's it's hard <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's definitely a complex situation to navigate and there's kind of like assessing somebody on competence and then from an underlying position of safety but then like is your assessment of competence really like objective which is of course like there's always bias in every situation or like have you you know created this uh, this so-called air mm -hmm. quotes objective assessment of competence but in reality race and 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 sex or gender have played a role into your assessment of that right and so that's that's difficult to navigate i think tangentially this makes me think um <clears throat> I don't know if you maybe like I'm sure you follow Will Gad on Instagram or something. Maybe, maybe not. Do you? I, I know of him. Yeah. I, I okay. I well, like sure. he was. I think like people had posted like there was like it was a couple years ago. There was like this group of climbers who like climbed Yamanuska, and they were like in bike helmets and like just like drilling random bolt lines and not hitting in like the uh, expansion bolts deep enough where they're like sticking out like protruding like crazy. <laughs> and there was it was just like the most like unsafe crazy thing you could ever imagine of people who seem like they had just watched like some climbing video you know and then like gone and done this and uh and then and then i think afterwards like will gad actually like reached out to them and like offered to like give them like a free day of like safety training rather than chastising them but mm -hmm. i recommend anybody listening go like look it up it's actually quite like a it's kind of like endearing at the end of it that it had like this good thing but it was like just these two dudes just like just totally out to lunch going and doing something unbelievably <laughs> dangerous and so i think that's like clearly like an obvious like black and white you know like situation where it's just like yeah like that 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 was not that for sure yeah um yeah i i'd like uh to steer the conversation a little bit so um back to when you we were talking about representation you had said that you know you know sometimes you don't feel like talking about representation or you know you just want to talk about climbing um I, there's there's a specific article that was written by climbing magazine or climbing.com and um it mentioned a, just the topic of first black ascent like what does that phrase mean to you and what are your thoughts behind it i mean i guess it means whatever you want it to mean i i know i think when my friend my i guess friend quit i'm more friends with the writer now than I, I was before before she wrote it but I don't think that that wasn't her intent on writing the article. Um, I think she was really stoked and inspired by it. And I think that that's kind of where climbing took it and ran with it. And it was, I, I mean, I remember the Instagram comments for that thing. Like people were like, see, look, he says he doesn't care about this. And like people were using it to prove like both points. And it wasn't like that I, I cared or I didn't. Like I didn't go climb that thing to be the first black person to climb Moonlight Buttress. I mean, I actually did it because my friend James was like, hey, well, you're not going to climb El Cap. The wet weather's shitty. You should probably, I mean, the weather's bad. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go climb Moonlight Buttress. And he um, kind of like pushed me to go try that. And I I did. Like, so that was that was it really. Like, it wasn't like I was out to set some kind of statement or that. I didn't, honestly didn't even think I'd send that thing. So. <laughs> um, Yeah, I guess, I guess. Like I, I totally understand that, and I, I feel the, I, I, my understanding would be like, you know, again back to the topic. It's like you, you're a climber. You, you climbed Moonlight Buttress. Like that's a huge accomplishment. Um, you know, you weren't going into it being like I'm going to be the the first black climber. Um, I think it's interesting 
just I think this, you know, Max, you can kind of help me out here a little bit, you know, with Kai Leitner and and the first he, you know, the first black five fifteen. Um, like in terms of representation, like do you feel that these labels are important for representation and for the black community? Like, do you feel like, or do you feel like they are kind of going the opposite direction for what you feel is the best for the community? Um, that's, that's just so hard. Cause like I, my experience isn't the same as every other person of color. And I think like, like after I did send moonlight butchers, I think a lot of people, a lot of people were stoked about that. I think people from underrepresented communities were like, oh man, I see a person of color doing that. That is awesome. That's something I can do. The other one that I got like, that kind of surprised me was a lot of people who work full time <laughs> were like, oh yeah, Eddie's a teacher and he took a couple days off of work and went and got this thing done. Like, that's awesome. Like, I mean, I typically, I guess technically I am a pro climber now, but um, usually it's like people who, climb full time or the people who are, you know, doing these really big ascents. Not to say that there's other, there's definitely other like nine to fivers who are going up there and sending Moonlight Buttress. But I think that like that representation in any of those realms, I think is important to help you think about what, what is possible because, you know, it's really hard to know your limit personally, right? Like we all say like, there's these things we can't do. I can never do this. I can never do that. But once you start seeing people that are somewhat similar to you walking in your shoes, doing those similar things, I think that goes a long way. And I think that I don't think you have to have first X, Y, or Z ascent, but I think being able to tell and share those stories that aren't just like person goes and climbs five fifteen D and you're like, what? I don't even know what that was the difference between 14 A and 15 D. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. All Greek to me, man. doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's yeah. i mean i think it's important um as a way like in the storytelling aspect but yeah i don't know necessarily it's like those labels on routes necessarily need to be there yeah i think that makes sense it's it's like i think you're focusing on the story and what that means in terms of getting people inspired and getting people to take action and, and participate in the community i think that definitely makes a lot of sense so can i I, I won't say push back on that, but I guess something I'm wondering, which is a little bit of a contradiction then, is like, how does that perspective come in relation to the full circle expedition of like this first black Everest expedition, if that makes sense? And like, sorry, not to like, I, I hope we're not like pushing back too hard. I'm just really interested in all this. And it, it seems like a very interesting conversation. So like, how, do, how does that, how does that perspective go in relation to the full circle uh, expedition, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, sure. I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, Moonlight Butchers is like, that's my personal climbing. Like, that's mm -hmm. what I'm out to do. That's what I'm psyched to do. I didn't really care if there was media around it or not. Like, I, I yeah. wasn't a sponsored athlete at the time or anything like that. Um, the Everest Expedition, I mean, there was a lot that went on with the Everest Expedition. One, I mean, Everest costs a ridiculous amount of money. Um, two, I think that there was... I mean, it was expensive, but also like the guy who the main idea was Phil Henderson. And I mean, he, you know, he's lived in my shoes for like being a part of the outdoor industry as a, a black person for like 30, 35 years. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not even, not even 35 years old, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, so he's kind of lived that. And I think, you know, one, we wanted to go to Everest one, we had to market going to Everest. And so at that time, I think from a marketing standpoint, I mean, sorry, I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't a, it wasn't even an all black ascent. I mean, we, we worked with Sherpas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like it, it wasn't an all black ascent. We had Sherpas on our team. Um, we had Sherpas that I actually taught at the climbing school in Fort say six months before the expedition. And then they worked with us there and helped it. Like we couldn't have summoned the mountain without the Sherpas, but also, um, so I would say a lot of it in terms of that was like marketing and also like this expedition, like Phil proposed this more because he had the goal of inspiring people to, to climb, to get outside, to, to find, you know, something to inspire them. Because I mean, when you look at the black and brown community, I think there is a, I mean, we have, you know, lots heart disease is a huge thing. I mean, there's a lot of sedentary folks. There's a lot of, a lot of things. And 
and a lot of, you know, black people ultimately like this project was more, was, I would say, I think it inspired the community as a whole, but it was more to inspire like other people of color to like say like, Hey, this is something that is okay. Cause there is a big thing within the black community. Like, Oh man, climbing, that's white person stuff. Camping, that's white person stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's yeah, not yeah. necessarily true. Um, but that exposure, right. To say like, Hey, look, like there's a bunch of black people going in and climbing Everest. Like, you know, I used to, I managed the email and the Instagram for that for, you know, when we were getting off the ground and so many people are like, Oh man, you guys are trying to climb Everest. I guess I could go like, you know, do a hike once a week or get out, even get outside once a week. Like people are sending these emails, like yeah. just really stoked to see this happen. So it, that project I think was for a different purpose and it was something that I, I uh, got invited to do and then eventually agreed to and became involved with. And I think Phil wanted to make sure that he had a, he had a team that was fit to climb the mountain. And honestly, like we look at lack of representation and lack of black people doing these things. And I mean, Phil had been doing this stuff for 35 years and he, the team was made up of any person that he met that he thought could potentially be successful in Everest. And to see that, that that's like a very, very small group of people. Yeah. Not yeah. to say that he's met every black person who climbs or has been in the outdoors ever, but from his experiences, right, that's, that's very small. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's a really great point where hopefully I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it's almost like with like the nose and moonlight, it's like, those were like, I hate the term selfish, but like selfish personal endeavors, just like for yourself. Whereas it seems like full circle is like almost like the message of climbing was transcending to this community. And like the climb itself was secondary. Does that make sense to like yeah. inspire individuals? Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and, and I think that makes sense. And like in relation to like, you know, Phil's experience, but I can't imagine like I'm 30 years old, but sometimes we take like progress for granted and you can think of like, you know, the static place in time right now, like 2024, but like, you know, what was like Phil's experience getting into the outdoor community? Like, you know, 30 years ago, it's like, it's totally crazy. Right. And then like, we're still here where we are today. So yeah, it's, it's easy to take uh, the position you're in at that place in time for granted and just think like, oh yeah, progress or things getting better or just like self-evident, like osmosis is just like going to happen, you know? And it's like, well, actually it's like been people doing things to like make that a reality, if that makes sense over time. Yeah. Um, a little tangential here, but like, I have a funny note, like in my, in my notes. Cause like, I think you, you, uh, you, you summited Everest at like two 30 in the morning. Right. Is that true? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Like, I don't know why I found it really funny. Just something like not to diminish the ascent at all. Like I can't imagine how cool it was, but I was like, kind of like, like top of the world with no view. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know why I found that funny, but I was like, like, did that, did that bug you at all? Like being on the top and not having a view at all? Or were you, was there just something like peaceful and ser serene about being in the darkness there, like on the top of the world? Um, I mean, honestly, it, it didn't really, really bug me. Um, I don't know. I just, again, that we just talked about this ever since more of like a community, a community project. Right. Yeah. And like, honestly, as soon as we raised enough money and like actually booked the flights and got to, and got to, uh, go to Nepal, it's like, man, okay, we made it. We're done. Like, yeah. That sounds really, <laughs> really bad. And I'm not trying <laughs> the, to, yeah, the, the hard part's over. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be honest, funny, like yeah. for real, like I was, I was like up, I, you know, we were talking about being busy like that year that year leading up to Everest was probably one of the hardest years of my life. Wow. I was every day, like I would go to work, I would teach some afternoons I would coach. Then I would get on my computer and like, you know, check emails, do these things, email potential sponsors. Some days I'd have to do meet, like the media was showing up to my school, like asking if they could interview me about X, Y, or Z for the, the expedition. And yeah, I didn't sleep that year. And the worst part is I didn't really rock climb that, that much that year. And the rock climbing is the thing I was really stoked about. So yeah, like that was a really tough year in terms of like, like it wasn't just like people paid us to go climb Everest. It was like, we, I literally worked another full-time job to raise money to, for this to happen. And it was kind of like me and Phil did the brunt of the fundraising. And so we were, you know, like I said, planning meetings every day, like working on the pitch deck, talking to companies, talking about deliverables. There's a film project that's at some point going to come out and it, you just like, 
it's hard to not sleep and to not climb. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I guess to go back to the original question, like when we got there, I was like, oh man, this is nice. I can just like relax and like hike a little bit each day. And yeah, like I knew Everest was going to be hard, but like, that's like a challenge that like you're willingly putting yourself in a challenge to do those things. And I guess we were willingly to do all the other things, but I mean, sitting on checking emails is just not fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When it comes down to it. Can I ask you one thing? What, like what, what in the future is inspiring you? Like what, what's next? You know, you seem very like, uh, you know, goal oriented and stuff. And so like, what, what, what's inspiring you? Yeah. Right now I'm just, I'm really trying, I'm still working on balance and everything like we're exactly where we started, right? Like how do you balance all of these things? And so I started doing a training plan because I want to get, I want to get stronger. Like I've kind of, I don't want to say plateaued because I've diversified what I've been good at at climbing for the past couple of years, but you know, I've been climbing in the same grade range for the past couple of years and I kind of have, I want to want to try to go after some bigger objectives this summer, which involve being at, just being a little bit stronger. So I've been working on that this spring a lot, which has been a little bit less climbing outside, a little bit more hangboarding, which I absolutely <laughs> hate doing. <laughs> um, and so like right now we're just working on summer plans. Like I'll go, go to California for a lot of June and climb in Yosemite and just kind of get better at climbing on granite. And then the summer we're trying to figure out the most family baby friendly place to go, to go, uh, climbing in the summer. And then nice. in the fall, I'm hoping to go out to the Valley for a couple of weeks, not a couple of weeks, probably like 10 days to, uh, climb. So nice, man. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. So I kind of just like, you know, structure the year around like, okay, how can I have the most, make the most out of my time off in the summer? Yeah. Now that now that you're a, a air quotes, a maybe even not air quotes sponsored climber, do you have do you feel like a pressure to perform more than you did before? Not not really. Um, honestly, like like working with Patagonia, they've been they've been great. They've been super super relaxed, and they're like as long as you just you know keep telling your story, and you know there's a lot of other random things that we do kind of as ambassadors, but. Uh, They've been really low pressure, which has been been nice. But I guess for me personally, it's always like, you know, when I got into climbing, I always wanted to, you know, climb the diamond, climb another route on the diamond every summer. Uh, I always, I was really intrigued in trying out big mountains, and I, I actually quit climbing big mountains before Everest came up. But I was really intrigued about like, you know, climbing big mountains, and so I was kind of always rotating between these like different genres and dis different disciplines of climbing and. And now I'm kind of back to the point where, oh, I want to try to climb something harder again. So Moonlight was nice. like two years ago. And the cycle I've, continues. You know what I mean? So it's just, yeah. that's, you guys are probably the same way with your climbing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a little <laughs> different. I want to climb harder grades, but I'm kind of in this perpetual cycle this, where it's like, I'm trying to do everything. You know, I'm, I'm trying to trail run. I'm trying to climb higher peaks. I'm trying to do high altitude. And then I'm trying to trad, you know, in at Squamish in this, in the summer. And it's like, eventually, if you want to really progress at one, you've got to kind of like pick that one and like stick with it. And that's been hard because there's, it's just too fun. Yeah. There's too many good sports to do, you know, it's like, yeah. I want to do it all. So, but that's, uh, that's tricky. Yeah. But I think it all, it all like kind of helps in a way, right? Like, Mm -hmm. like if you're trail running then you can be out for really long days if you're mm -hmm. yeah i don't know I, I feel like it all it all helps piece together a little bit and i don't know i think you, at least for me like if i just bouldered like right now i'm just hangboarding i'm i'm, I'm i know i'm gonna get burnt out from hangboarding at some point <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah well thanks for thanks for coming on the show or thanks for your time and uh yeah. yeah i feel like we had a great conversation yeah yeah, likewise. Awesome. Uh, really appreciate your time, Eddie, and everything. I know you're, you know, super busy guy, and so we we do really appreciate you coming on the show and having a chat with us. So thanks again. Yeah, no problem. Hopefully, uh, you got some good content that people enjoy. <laughs>